Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Cowichi Canyon Conservancy and Yakima Valley College Winter Speaker Series. It's great to have you all here. My name is Matthew Lozier. I'm a faculty member here in the Life Sciences Department in Yakima Valley College. And just a couple notes before we get started. Uh, it would be great if you would keep your microphones muted. And note that we are recording this session with the hope that we'll be able to post it on the Cowichi Canyon Conservancy website and um, Yakima Valley College uh, website. And I would like the opportunity to start us off with a land acknowledgement, uh, given the nature of our talk and uh, where I'm located here in Yakima. So I will begin to say we acknowledge the people who have been on this land since time immemorial. The Yakima people remain committed stewards of this land, cherishing it and protecting it as instructed by elders through generations. We are honored and grateful to be here today on their traditional lands and give thanks to the legacy of the original people, their lives and their descendants. Through conservation of the Cowichi Canyon and surrounding lands, I hope that we all contribute to this legacy. So thank you again for being here. And I'm going to turn this over to Cy Philbrick with CCC. Thanks, Matthew. Welcome, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of new names and faces potentially, so I feel like I should start. Well, first by saying, hello, my name is Cy. I'm with Cowichi Canyon Conservancy. Um, and just by way of quick intro, for those who aren't familiar with Cowichi Canyon Conservancy, we are a, a land trust in Yakima and we run programs for the conservation of shrub step and we promote recreation and educational programming. So if, if folks aren't familiar, I invite you to learn more. Um, after this talk, you can find out info on cowichicanyon.org. And if you're inclined to support our work and programs like this one, um, we're always appreciative of support we can get um, anywhere. So please do. Um, just some quick housekeeping before we begin is like our talks last year, one of the, the beauties of doing this on Zoom is we can get a lot more people than we'd get at an in-person event. Um, but because of that, we really want to set some ground rules just for participating. Um, we're asking, like Matthew said, to please mute your microphones and to, if you have a question um, for tonight's speaker, please use the chat. Um, if, if you can figure out how to do that, um, just type your questions in and I'm gonna do my best to moderate the chat over the course of the evening um, and, and ask those questions at the end of, of Dr. Conway's talk. Um, so please do that. Just also for, for folks who aren't familiar with this talk series, this is the first of our series of winter talks. Um, we're excited for another season. The next one is on February 8th, coming right up. Um, it is by YBC's own Zach Sherl which is exciting. Um, and it will be, I'm, I, I'm particularly proud of the title. It's called Who's Afraid of the Light? A Natural History of Darkness. Um, so who wouldn't want to tune into that? It sounds pretty exciting to me. That's on February 8th, same time. Um, and we'll be sending out a Zoom link very shortly for so folks can find out where to, where to tune in for that. So tonight's talk, is by Dr. Courtney Conway. Um, Courtney comes to us from the University of Idaho where he's a professor of wildlife sciences. He is also impressively a director of the US Geological Survey's Idaho Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit. So both academic and government background, which I think is an interesting perspective. And I'm excited about tonight's talk for two reasons. One, he's gonna be talking about an, an owl that I think most of us know very little about um, that lives in our surrounding shrub step. And two, he's gonna be describing the process of science, which it isn't always something we get a chance to hear about, I think in, in these winter lectures, even though they're all science-based. 
Um, he's going to be describing how we learn something new about a mysterious creature. So I'm excited. And without further ado, Courtney. Thanks, Sai. And thanks, Matthew. Can everybody hear me OK? Great. All right, let me get my slides uh, pulled up. All right. Uh, well, thanks everybody for coming on a cold winter night. Um, as I said, uh, this is a talk about burrowing owls, and this is the breeding range of burrowing of the western burrowing owl. So there's in North America there's a uh, there's burrowing owls in Florida, and they're a separate subspecies. But what I'm going to be talking about today is the western burrowing owl, and this is the breeding range of the western burrowing owl. The dark gray here um, in, uh, in this color in, in most of their range is where they're extant, where they occur currently. Um, but the range has declined uh, in, in many areas and such that they have been, and they've been extirpated. They've been eliminated from portions of the range, including a big portion of um, Washington here where they no longer exist. They've also, their range is also contracted on the eastern front of their range here in this light gray and also in coastal California. So their range has, uh, has been shrinking over the uh, last century. Whoops. And uh, in Canada, uh, they, they, have, they have declined uh, very precipitously to the point that they are a federally endangered species in Canada. And so this is the trend line over the past uh, 50 years in Canada, and they're really on the verge of extinction such that they have multiple captive breeding facilities where they're captively breeding burrowing owls and releasing them back into the wild to try to uh, prevent them from going extinct. This is the uh, trend, uh, population trend of burrowing owls in the US. It's much uh, less extreme. Um, they're, they have declined overall, but uh, they are not federally listed as threatened or endangered in the US, but they are listed as a species of national conservation concern because they, they are rare and they have declined. Here's another way of looking at um, the, uh, survey data from throughout the Western uh, US. Uh, and based on um, survey routes throughout the Western US, most of the surveys uh, are show a negative population decline for burrowing owls, but there are some areas that show a positive uh, trend. So although they're um, primarily decreasing in most areas, there are areas where they're increasing. And unfortunately, uh, in Eastern Washington, uh, Washington is one of the states where they have declined the most, as I showed you in that distribution map, this is the uh, trend line for the state of Washington, and they're really close to, to being extirpated from the state of Washington. Over the past 50 years, they've declined dramatically in Washington. So over the past 25 years, I have been working on uh, this question of why burrowing owls are declining. And uh, in a more, um, structured way why they're declining in some areas, but not declining in others. And so the fact that there's this variation that they're, that they're um, uh, declining in some areas and they're not declining in some cases, even increasing in other areas provides a lot of um, opportunity to uh, see how those locations differ. What is it that causes burrowing owls to decline in some places, but not in others? And so that's, that's really been the focus of uh, part of my research program for the past 25 years. That research program started when I lived in Eastern Washington. Uh, I was an adjunct professor at the WSU campus in the Tri-Cities where I, where I started working on burrowing owls right after my PhD. But uh, the other thing that I wanna leave you with today is that, um, uh, that this, that this this bird, burrowing owls, are really one of the oddest birds in the, in, in the animal community. They're just weird birds, and they're, they're odd for, for a variety of different reasons. One of the reasons they're odd is that 
they're considered a diurnal owl. So when we think of owls, we think of birds that, that have all these adaptations for living and hunting uh, at night. And so almost all owls are nocturnal. It's kind of their calling card. Yet here we have this, this owl uh, amongst us here in, in, the, in the Western US. It's an owl that lives in grasslands and shrub steppe throughout the Western North America. And yet it's routinely referred to as a diurnal owl. So it has all these, the same adaptations of other owls where it can see really well at night, has these large eyes, but it is really active during the day. No other owl is like that. Another really odd thing about this bird is that it lays its eggs 10 feet underground. So when you see a burrowing owl in the wild, it's typically standing at the entrance to a hole in the ground like this. Here's, here's a natural um, example of that. And down in that hole, typically 10, 11, 12 feet underground is where the, it lays its eggs and it's, uh, the eggs hatch and the nestlings uh, grow. And so this is 10 feet, typically 10 feet underground. There's no other bird that does that. It's just an odd bird. There are the only other birds that lay their eggs underground are a handful of flightless birds like the kiwi and a handful of seabirds. But those birds are, um, are birds, they, they lay their eggs like within a foot or so from the surface. They don't lay their eggs 10 feet underground. And so this is what a, a nest chamber looks like 10 feet underground. This is the clutch the eggs of a burrowing owl nest. We have uh, specially designed uh, infrared probes that we push down into these burrows so that we can um, observe what's going on underground. There's the female that's tucked herself away because we've got this weird probe coming down to document uh, the eggs. So, so, so no other bird does this. No other bird lays their eggs this far underground. They also spend a lot of time uh, on the surface of the ground, running and jumping and doing weird uh, behaviors. So you're, you're just as likely to see a burrowing owl doing this, skipping across the surface of the ground, as you are to see one flying. No, very few birds you can say that about. They're, they're, they're just odd birds. Here's another picture of a, from, from our probe. You can see the, um, that we have a camera attached to this probe and the female is sitting on her eggs. Uh, you can see the roots coming down from the, the, the soil up above in her, in her nest chamber. And one of the other really unique things about this bird is that they lay really large clutches. So uh, clutch size in birds is the number of eggs that they lay per reproductive attempt. So the number of eggs that they lay at once. And so, 96% um, of the birds in the world, this is, the, this is all the birds of the world, 96% of them lay five or fewer eggs. So you can see most of them lay only two eggs. Um, and so here's burrowing owls. Their average clutch size is eight and a half eggs. There's very, very few birds in the entire world that lay this many eggs per reproductive attempt. And the only other birds that do are a handful of ducks or uh, upland game birds. So it's very unusual for an owl, especially one that nests underground, to lay this many eggs. When you lay this many eggs, of course, you have the, um, you, that, that translates into a lot of uh, offspring, a lot of uh, nestlings. So this is uh, a, a typical picture that you might see at the entrance to that nest burrow, the hole in the ground. Once they get once the eggs hatch and the nestlings get old enough, they start to come up above ground. So here's the adult, and here's uh, all these brown brown jobbies here are the are the juveniles that are starting to come up above ground. Here's a picture of a family group with the juveniles that have come up above ground. This is mom and dad giving each other a morning hug, and these are uh, eight nestlings that have come up from the hole, which is right behind them. So they often do this. They want to see the sun every now and then come out of that deep hole 
and they'll congregate right at the entrance to their hole. So the other thing I want to point out about this um, kind of classic picture of a burrowing owl nest is all this debris that's scattered around the entrance to that hole. I'm going to talk about that more in a minute. But um, the other thing um, that, that happens because they have lay so many eggs and that they have so many nestlings is that the, the, the eggs don't all hatch on the same day because there's too many of them. So that the, the, they, because there's so many eggs, the first ones start to hatch before the last ones do. And so what that, um, what that produces is a size hierarchy among the siblings in, in the brood. So this is a, these are uh, siblings, brothers and sisters from, a, from the same nest. And you can see this little, little guy here is about half the size of his or her older sibling. And for those of you who grew up with older brothers and sisters like I did, you know that this, this poor guy gets uh, tormented in a lot of different ways when you have this kind of size hierarchy among siblings, especially when you're cramped down in a hole 10 feet underground. And so this is the kind of thing that happens when that, when that size hierarchy is produced. You have, thing, you have brothers and sisters doing things like this, which is what happened to me with my older brother when I was growing up. So there's a lot of uh, uh, aggression among the siblings. There is infanticide. There is siblicide. Um, so when you have that big of a family group, they don't always get along. So... Again, these are weird birds. They're just odd. They're just unusual birds. Another really odd thing about burrowing owls is that they do something that no other bird does. They collect mammal manure, shred it, and put it at the entrance to their nest burrow. So this is the, a nest burrow of a burrowing owl right here. And all of this brown stuff is mammal manure that the, the parents have gone out and collected in the surrounding area and brought to their nest burrow. They, they leave it at their nest burrow and they bring it down all the way down 10 feet down into their nest burrow as well. This is an extremely odd behavior. Most birds try to get rid, go to great efforts to get rid of their own poop from their nest. They're trying to disguise their nest. They don't want the negative bacteria uh, aspects that come with poop around their nest. This bird collects other animals' poop and brings it to its nest. It's really, really odd. And so one of my first graduate students, uh, well, my very first graduate student, worked on this uh, as a question for his uh, master's thesis. Why in the world would a bird bring other animals' poop to its nest. And so we uh, tested four different hypotheses as to why that might be something that is beneficial to these birds. And the, the hypothesis that, that uh, had the most support was that what they're doing is attracting insects for the juveniles to eat. And so um, insects uh, like manure, especially uh, certain families of beetles, and so this, these are the data from my first master's student's thesis, where we uh, uh, eliminated manure from some nests, and we brought even more manure to others. And so the nests with, with, with manure had twice as many much insect biomass in the areas surrounding their nest than the nests where we removed manure. So we think they're doing this to attract uh, insects, particularly beetles, to the nest so that the juveniles can practice their foraging behavior. So that was all a cool story for my first master's student and uh, it generated a lot of attention because it's such a weird, unusual behavior. But the problem is in, in our studies, we found that there are some burrowing owls that exhibit the same type of behavior, but Instead of bringing manure to, the, to their burrow, they bring other objects. So here is an example of a burrowing owl nest. And what it, it happens to be uh, very close to a golf course. 
And so this particular burrowing owl basically was going to the golf course and collecting grass divots from the golfers and bringing it and putting it all around its nest in the same way that other owls, uh, most owl burrowing owls do with manure. Here's another example. Um, this is a burrowing owl nest in Arizona uh, where I worked for 11 years, where this burrowing owl collected uh, fragments of clothing from illegal immigrants near the border and was bringing it to the entrance to its nest burrow in the same way that most burrowing owls bring manure. So that was a real head scratcher. Why would, if, if, if the cause of this really weird behavior is to attract insects who like manure, wh why would some uh, other owls, other burrowing owls, do the same thing with grass divots and with clothing? So uh, we still have some work that we're um, doing on this question. What we, our leading hypothesis right now is that this actually re these these materials actually retain moisture as does manure, and because burrowing owls live in um, in dry environments, everywhere they live is a dry environment in shrub steppe and grassland and desert systems. That 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 insects may be also attracted to um, moisture that is retained by clothing or um, grass divots. So what I described to you is a really, really, really weird behavior. These owls are just weird. They're weird birds. I can't say it any nicer way. The other really odd thing about them is they have evolved a vocalization to mim that mimics rattlesnakes. So they, they raise their young down in this 10 foot uh, down in a burrow. That makes them very, um, susceptible to any animal that can go down in that burrow because it's, it's, it's a dead end. They, they have no way to escape a predator that, that can go down into that hole. And snakes, of course, are very adept at going down into holes. And so burrowing owls, um, juveniles, make this vocalization that turns out to be a what we call a Batesian mimic perfect Batesian mimic of a rattlesnake rattle. So they, uh, there has been, um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you listen to it right now. This is what uh, a juvenile, group of juvenile burrowing owls sound like when you disturb them down in, in their nest chamber. So that, that's, that's a really unusual um, call for, for a bird, that, that there's no real analogy to that call. And there has been scientists that have done um, sonograms and spectrograms uh, of, the, of this uh, hissing of burrowing owls. And it is almost identical structurally to a, a rattlesnake rattle. So they... Uh, the other really interesting thing about Western burrowing owls is that they really depend on these holes in the ground. That's what they, you know, their, their whole reproductive um, behavior, their whole fitness depends on these holes in the ground, but they don't dig their own holes. They are reliant on other animals to dig the holes for them. So what they do is they take over holes that were built by other animals. Uh, prairie dogs, ground squirrels, badgers, tortoises, any other animal that digs holes, burrowing owls, um, take advantage of and uh, live sympatrically with, and they use the abandoned holes that other animals dig. And so I uh, did a recent uh, summary of what is the primary critter that they depend on throughout the range. So this map is a complicated um, uh, map of, of lots of different colors, but if you look uh, broadly, if you take a step back, it's the same map that I showed you earlier of the breeding range of the burrowing owl. It's just now overlaid with different colors based on what 
species they depend on most for their nest burrow. So as you can see, uh, the biggest color here is the black-tailed prairie dog. And the largest portion of their range um, west or east of the uh, continental divide, they rely on black-tailed prairie dog burrows. Here in Washington, they rely on uh, yellow-bellied marmots and uh, badger burrows primarily. So there's variation uh, within these color patterns, but the point here is that they rely on a whole variety of different animals to, to dig their nest burrows for them. And, and the, one, the ones that they rely on really varies across their breeding range in North America. And so what that allowed me to do is say, okay, well, this, this burrowing owl is declining. This, species, this owl is declining. We don't really know why. Um, a lot of people in the literature had said it's because of, of the eradication of prairie dogs. And so after I produced this map that I just showed you, I could then overlay survey data to say, okay, where are they declining the most? And the prediction based on um, past uh, statements about why burrowing owls are declining would have said, well, they're gonna be declining most precipitously uh, where they overlap with, burrow, uh, with prairie dogs because that's been identified as one of the primary causes of their decline. But when I overlaid the, the trend data, the survey data with those colors that I mentioned, here, based on what they what animal that they, they rely on most in different portions of the range, it turns out that the black-tailed prairie dog, the Gunnison prairie dog, and the white-tailed prairie dog is not where they're declining the most. This is the average um, percent of survey routes with declines. And so they, the black-tailed prairie dogs is really close to the average, and the Gunnison and white-tailed is really low. They're, they're, not, they're actually uh, increasing in those areas. So where they're really declining the most is in areas where they rely on Richardson's ground squirrels, badgers, California ground squirrels. So they, it turns out they have a very uh, love-hate relationship with badgers, which is, again, what they rely on um, a lot in, in Washington. So they, although they rely on badgers to dig nest burrows for them. They, they, they take over badger burrows once a badger abandons that burrow. Badgers also eat our voracious predators. So they, also, they eat um, eggs or nestlings if they come across one. And so here's a picture of, a, of an adult burrowing owl attacking a, a badger. So all the, you know, the, the burrowing owl needs the badger to build the hole, but then wants the badger to get out of dodge so it can have the hole without the badger eating its nestling. So it's a very weird relationship that is um, not commensalism, not mutualism, not competition, not you know a combination of predation and um, uh, uh, and I guess some form of commensalism. Here's another example of a, uh, a desert tortoise burrow. This is down in the southwest. A desert tortoise uh, built a burrow. It went out for a walkabout. It came back, and this burrowing owl had taken it over and laid eggs in it. So now this burrowing owl is trying to trying to be bigger than that that desert tortoise and saying, "Yeah, sorry, this is taken now. You you were gone too long." So I mentioned um, that snakes can can go down into that burrow and and potentially eat the eggs or the nestlings and, and, and that they've evolved that hiss that sounds like a rattlesnake hiss. I'm gonna show you a little video here. This is a, a burrowing owl nest with, this isn't a rattlesnake, this is a gopher snake, but it's a large snake that, uh, that likes to eat eggs. And so this is, uh, we had a, we put cameras down in burrowing owl nests, uh, infrared cameras, so we can get uh, footage on a variety of different behaviors. And so this, this snake uh, is down in this burrowing owl's burrow while, this, while the burrowing owl was away foraging, taking a break from foraging. So the, the snake has already eaten one of the eggs and, and has really kind of uh, scattered the, the clutch. The eggs are no longer together because the, the snake has been rummaging around in there. And so uh, the, the, bur the burrowing owl is about to come home um, and uh, see this. 
So just watch here. There, here comes the burrowing owl, just comes down, down its hole and says, oh boy. So this is pitch black. This is an infrared camera taking this footage. So it's not providing any light, even though it looks like it is. So it's pitch black. The burrowing owls obviously senses that something's up. You can see the snake's head over here. It's, it's sensing something is uh, up. They're, they're both just kind of motionless, trying to figure out the situation. What to do, what should I do? So the burrowing owl starts slowly walking over there to her eggs. The snake's getting nervous. You can see, you can see the burrowing owl's leg bands that we have on it. Wants to get back to her eggs, she just steps on the snake. But right now, she's just she just wants to get back to her eggs. She's just like, I just want my eggs back. The snake's like, oh, maybe I better leave. But she's stepping on his body right here. So he's like, whoa, wait a minute, you gotta get off my body. This is when things start to get ugly. Okay, now she's mad. Okay, now we got a game on here. So she grabbed him with her beak and she threw him off to the side. But now he wants more. He's coming back for more. So now we got a real uh, wrestling match going on. Uh, now the snake finally just said, I'm out of here and took off. So maybe a... Owl two, snake one. The snake got to eat one egg, but the owl uh, successfully got it out of there. So as I mentioned, uh, growing owls eat insects. They eat um, a lot of beetles and grasshoppers and other, other insects, but that's not the only thing they eat. Growing owls are very um, broad in their diet. They eat a lot of different things. So here's a, a growing owl in Washington that um, a colleague got a great photo of flying in with, with a, a beetle that it had caught. Here's a picture of a, uh, a young juvenile with a grasshopper that's almost as big as, as him. And uh, I don't know how he's going to eat that whole thing, but he's going to try. And here's another quick video. This is, again, down in the nest uh, of an uh, adult growing owl with um, nestlings here and uh, she has brought uh, a small mammal. So the small mammal is too big for the, uh, the young nestlings to eat. And so the adult has to pick little bits off of the carcass, yank little tiny bits off and then feed it to, that's a piece of grass, but uh, and she ate that one herself. So she's yanking little pieces off of, of the rodent and then feeding it to the nestlings who don't, uh, don't even have their eyes open yet. Well, that was a big piece. Okay. Uh, here, here's a great uh, photo of um, the, the lower half of a frog that, uh, that the upper half has already been eaten in a burrowing owl has in its mouth. So they're very broad in their diet. They eat primarily rodents and insects, but they'll eat frogs, birds, snakes, bats, um, really anything they can get their, their mouths on. So they're very um, broad in their diet, but insects and, and small rodents are what they uh, eat mostly. So um, one of the uh, cool things that I've been working on uh, a lot the past six or eight years is uh, burrowing owl migration and how it might be uh, associated with the declines uh, of burrowing owls and why they've declined in some areas, not in others. So for the past six or eight years, I've been putting um, satellite transmitters on burrowing owls throughout their entire range. Here's a map of locations where I've put, my colleagues and I have put uh, transmitters on burrowing owls. So initially we were putting uh, what are called geolocators. That's what this is on this burrowing owl's back um, on the cover of High Country News. And, um, and then when the technology got 
uh, good enough, about five years ago, we switched to uh, something called PTTs. These are solar powered satellite transmitters that provide much more precision of tracking birds throughout the annual cycle. So these are the, all the locations throughout that, you know, burrowing owl range where we've been putting, where we put transmitters on uh, burrowing owls during the breeding season so that we could track where they go during the winter season. And so to do that, uh, we have to trap them first. So we, we use a couple different trapping methods. Um, I'm gonna show you some photos of, of, of one of those trapping methods. One of the trapping methods is pictured here. It's called a, a spring trap. It's also called a bow net. There two, has two different names. And it, uh, it, it, it utilizes a, a live mouse. So we go to um, pet stores and get a live mouse and build a little cage for it. Um, and we put it out on the ground. And so there's a little monofilament here that goes back to this um, spring trap. And so it's, it's a, uh, basically a tent that, uh, that's on a spring that's folded back. And so now um, when, it, when an owl touches that cage, trying to get to the mouse, this is what happens. The, the, that tent springs over the top of both the mouse cage and the owl that's trying to get to the mouse and gets caught in this cage. Once we catch uh, an owl, then we spend some time um, taking measurements and then putting a uh, backpack satellite transmitter on it. So this is me putting uh, one of those um, satellite transmitters on a burrowing owl. And this is what it looks like after that transmitter is attached. There are tiny little solar panels right here on the back of the transmitter to keep it charged because it, ha it can't, um, it's, it's small, it needs to be too small um, to uh, support heavy batteries. So the only um, technology we could use, we're using kind of cutting edge um, telemetry equipment here. It has to have a solar power, so it relies on the sun to recharge the transmitter. Be releasing one, so this is just a short little video uh, after we just attach that harness to a female burrowing owl. Fine with that transmitter on, and uh, then we get uh, locations from the uh, Argos system, the satellite uh, international Argos system, uh, daily of, of where that bird goes, uh, and we get that from the comfort of our office. And so this is uh, just a fun picture of uh, our my team this past summer, where we put out twenty four. Uh, of those solar powered satellite transmitters. So we, we spent a week trapping growing owls and we attached uh, 24 transmitters, satellite transmitters to growing owls. And so, you know, the goal of this is to find out where each population migrates and whether certain populations that, that migrate just, you know, if, if there's any correlation, if there's any association between where they winter and what, whether they're declining or not. And so um, burrowing owls uh, have to migrate. This is a picture of a burrowing owl in um, Grangeville, Idaho, about an hour south of me, uh, about an you know, hour, hour and a half south of Pullman, um, Washington, in Grangeville, Idaho. In the, in the fall, so this this owl was migrating south, but it didn't leave <laughs> quick enough, and so it was in a, a hole in the ground on its on its way uh, south. Then it got stuck in a snowstorm in the fall, and so it had to dig through the snow from the hole that's a foot or so down below, just so that it could get to the surface. It didn't stay here much longer. It eventually continued its migration south. 
So here's, I'm going to show you a, a, just a handful of slides of, of the results of these transmitters that we've deployed. It's been a huge effort over the past six to eight years. And so this um, is a picture of the geolocator data from, that we did the first couple of years that I mentioned, the 296 geolocators that we attached. Um, the red uh, lines are connecting the, the breeding burrow, the breeding location to where the owl wintered. The red is females and the blue is males. And so, as you can see, there's some spatial pattern to where they migrate. Uh, the other thing that you can uh, sort of see is that females tend to migrate further south than males. That's a pattern that uh, is true in almost all birds. Uh, males tend to migrate shorter distances than females in almost all birds, and that's true with burrowing owls. And you can see that the birds that uh, breed here in, in Washington and Northeastern Oregon, primarily winter in California. Whoops, what happened there? Okay, and, and so this, uh, and, and then this is a, a summary of, of the satellite transmitters. The previous one was the, the geolocators. It's a different technology. The satellite transmitters provide much, much more detailed and more regular location data to, to actually map their um, path during migration. And so uh, these colors are not males and females. They are, each color is a different individual owl. And so again, you can see that the owls in Oregon and Washington are wintering in California. The, the owls that breed in Idaho and Utah are wintering in Baja, California and in the border area of Arizona and all wintering in uh, mainland Mexico. So there's some, some real geographic patterns as to where breeding populations in the US spend the winter. And so we're really interested in documenting that because it may correlate with why certain populations are declining and others are not. Because we know that owls in Oregon and Washington and California are declining more The other thing I want to, want to point out here with, that, that became apparent with uh, our recent work on, on migration is that if you'll notice, there's a big bottleneck here. There's like an hourglass. All, a lot of these owls are, are funneling through this small area near the Texas panhandle. And, and these dots along the route are stopovers. You'll also notice there's a lot of owls are, 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 are having, um, are doing stopovers here of two, three, four, 10, 12 days during migration where they just hang out for a while and rest, recoup, and then before they continue migrating. So there's this real irrigation in this, uh, this area that became very obvious to us that we didn't see elsewhere. Um, this is just another slide showing you the, the, the real uh, global magnitude of these migrations. So it's the same same data well, with these lines of these these different owls, but you can see the, the, the audio portion of that program. But I can't yeah, the globe. You can see the see the world, the curvature of the world. So you can see the magnitude of these migrations that's occurring. Really incredible. So again, back to this near, near Texas. Uh, it happens to be mostly focused around the area of Lubbock, Texas. So there's something really weird about Lubbock, Texas, that burrowing owls are really like. And I don't know if any of you have been to Lubbock. I've never been to Lubbock, Texas, but I pan, I really need to pack my bags and go visit Lubbock because there's something about Lubbock I can't that right here. people who study burrowing owls need to figure out. So if any of you have any ideas of why Lubbock is so special, let me know. The other little tidbit I'll show you about a, because it's about a Washington bird, is that this uh, one of our females that we tagged in Eastern Washington wintered on Santa Rosa Island. Santa Rosa and Santa Cruz Island are off the coast of, of uh, LA, basically, in Southern California. Um, and, and so we were able to document this bird migrating all the way down the coast. It hung out, dipping its foot in the water for a few days, and then it um, spent the winter 
in Santa Rosa on Santa Rosa Island, not a bad place to spend the winter. And then it uh, took a little hop over to Santa Cruz and then headed back north the following spring. So these are kind of really cool detailed data we can get from these satellite transmitters. The other real interesting thing that has come out of this, um, so far of this, uh, uh, from these satellite transmitters is that um, burrowing owls are, are much more um, uh, dedicated to their wintering site than they are their breeding site. This was really un, unexpected and um, not predicted. So we, we tend to think of all birds being very tied to their breeding location, having breeding territories and returning each year to the same breeding territory. And burrowing, most burrowing owls do that, although sometimes they, we've documented that they, that they don't. We had an, a burrowing owl that bred in Washington one year and the next year it bred in Oregon. But uh, the surprise is that, 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 the, that we have yet to find a burrowing owl that has not returned to the exact same wintering site. They're much more uh, dedicated. They're much more committed to their wintering sites than they are their breeding sites. And that was a real surprise. So again, the, these areas here at the end of these migratory routes, they are in the winter down in Mexico and in Baja, they're, they're, they really hang tight. And they, if they, when they come back to you, they go back to the exact same spot in the wintering ground. But they don't always go back to the same breeding site. They're much more dedicated to those wintering locations. So these birds are just weird. They're unusual in so many ways. They're just odd birds. Why? So some of the other data that we've uh, been able to uncover from these uh, transmitters is that the percent of owls that migrated um, uh, decreases as owls get older. And uh, males in the white bars are less migratory than females. So uh, older birds are less migratory and males are less migratory in burrowing owls. And uh, males that are here in gray that are larger are less migratory. So basically, if you're uh, a male, you're less likely to migrate. If you're large, you're less likely to migrate. And if you're old, you're less likely to migrate. The other thing I've done is, is pulled together studies from throughout the breeding range from uh, scientists um, from the past uh, 30 or 40 years from locations all around the US. The red stars are actually my own data and the yellow stars are data from um, papers that have been published in the literature. And so that has allowed me to look at um, the effects of uh, surrounding land use on some important reproductive traits. And so I'm just gonna summarize one of those. And so uh, this is the number of juveniles produced per nest location. And this is the predominant uh, landscape surrounding that study. And so as you can see, um, Owls that have been studied in urban agricultural areas um, have lower reproductive output than those that have been studied in, in more natural or rural landscapes. So, um, boring owls are kind of well known for being tolerating urban and agricultural landscapes, but their reproductive output is, um, is reduced as a result. And one of the many reasons it's reduced is because of things like this. And so, this is a, a not unfortunately not an uncommon occurrence where we'll find a burrowing owl right off the side of the road having yeah. a oh. Oh, here's a dead one um so but there's you know a lot of efforts throughout the range to try to um, protect burrowing owls put signage up and when you put a sign up near a burrowing owl burrowing owl likes it and stands on it burrowing owls are not shy of humans um they Here's you know, the, uh, a burrowing owl in Florida, that Florida subspecies that I mentioned at the outset. Um, they, they really um, tolerate humans uh, quite well, even though they um, don't tolerate vehicles as well. So they're not, um, they're not kind of shy of humans like a sage grouse is. They, they do tolerate us and our presence quite, 
quite well as long as we don't do things to um, uh, affect their survival or reproduction. So the things uh, I want to leave you with is, again, this is um, arguably the most interesting bird in the world. They're just weird, odd birds. And they're, uh, they're declining in Washington. They used to be much common. So get out and see one while you still can. Um, I want to thank some of the folks that have provided funding for, for the, some of the work that I talked about today. Uh, Wyoming Game and Fish Department, uh, Thunder Base Coal Company, Environment Canada. I work closely with a colleague in uh, Canada who works for the Canadian government where they're federally endangered. And surprisingly, I've had a lot of private donors that have provided the funding for the satellite transmitters um, who like to come out and, uh, and trap growing owls with us. Um, so with that, I will um, see if any of you have any questions and um, thank you for your time. <laughs>